Hey, what is up guys? Technicals Tinkers here, checking in on the 3D print operation for today, October 14th, Monday. Yeah, don't skip on the uh, on the infill with bamboo spools. So if you're unfamiliar, I'm a small business owner. I have a business that has nothing to do with 3D printing, but I already have a warehouse, already paying the rent, already paying electricity, overheads and such. Interested in 3D printing, I see the potential, so I'm trying to prove the concept here at home, uh, scale it up, and then maybe move it into my warehouse. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and like the video for more content like this. So what am I working on today? Well, if you saw yesterday's video, I had success finally in printing the other half of a large D20 cube, and so I had some issues with the seams. Let's, let's take a quick look at how it's looking now. And so out here in the building, I've got the D20 that I had finished up and glued together. Glue job came together pretty good. But the seam here, you know, leaves something to be desired. Now, I was going to use a deburring tool to kind of soften out the seam. But uh, I didn't want to have it make any more of a gap. And I suppose you could put some, like, fill, some, like, putty or something like that in there and then sand it down. But again, you're getting into a lot of post-production uh, with that. Threw a quick coat of copper metallic on it. Obviously, didn't do the bottom yet, but... Um, it's gonna need a few more coats, but I like the sheen. You can certainly see the lines. I mean, if you get in close, you're gonna see the imperfection in it. But uh, you know, the numbers came out pretty crispy, even with you know, obviously it needs more coats of paint to get all the nooks and crannies. But not too bad of a a piece, I think. Now, again, with this line here, it kind of leads me into thinking like, I really would just prefer to print this in one big go. So as you can see, the seam on there kind of leaves a lot to be desired. So I figured, okay, I'll print it in one big go. But I was hesitant about that in the future and you know, doing that uh, initially because I didn't want the print to fail and waste all that filament. And so of course, I should say luckily for me, I started this one and it failed pretty quickly. So now that's every single Cobra 2 Max has failed in terms of layer shifting. And this is my original Cobra. This is Cobra 1, the first one I ever had. It has the most amount of hours on it. But I just recently, I put a brand new whole extruder head unit on this because I went to uh, start a print. And I'm not sure if you, you've experienced this, anyone has experienced this. But when it goes down to sort of uh, make sure it's the proper level off the plate, it would just keep going down and gouge into the plate and the motors would just keep skipping teeth over and over again. It's like the LiDAR sensor or whatever sensor in here uh, just wasn't working. So I swapped it out and it works. Uh, and I took the other one out, retooled it, readjusted the sensor. Uh, but this one, there's no reason it should have layer shifted other than maybe getting caught on something. I am gonna try a different infill pattern. I tried triangles on this one, but that one's really no better than grid in terms of catching. But if you look, at how severe this layer shift is. That's, I mean, that's like three inches of shift. Um, just really unbelievable that it would shift that badly. Uh, and not only that, but it shifted on two axes, you know, cause it, it shifted this way and then it also shifted down. So, <laughs> I mean, maybe this machine's just, you know, they're not rated for that many hours or something. It is a cheap machine, but it is a big machine. And that's really kind of the, the place I'm at right now. Because if you're new to the channel, and again, welcome to everybody new, I'm kind of in the two different camps. And then 3D printing, I think it's safe to say that you can only really print two different types of things. Functional stuff, you know, brackets and uh, things that hold things that have a function, a purpose, and art prints, which, you know, have no purpose, but people want to just look at them and enjoy them. Now, these Cobra 2 Maxes kind of offer a unique uh, sort of thing in the functional prints and the art prints that the functional prints, I can fit a whole bunch of stuff on one build plate, or in the case of like my CPU mining stands, these computer stands that I make, uh, I make them full form because I believe I could, you know, it should be one solid piece instead of a bunch of little parts that could fail. It's more more areas that could fail. So having a big build plate is important to me uh, that I can do those or do a whole bunch of them. Also in art prints, it allows me to do big stuff. And I think that's a big barrier to entry. A lot of people don't do big stuff because they don't have a printer that's big enough or the failure rate, you know, if something does fail, it wastes a ton of filament. You know, and the real downside of this though is that the Anticubic Cover 2 Max is, it's not a very high quality machine. Um, you know, I've kind of experienced that. I've got thousands of hours on, you know, I think at least a thousand hours on every single machine combined many thousands of hours. And so some experience with them, haven't tinkered with them too much. Uh, I'm more inclined to say that, you know, these machines cost a refurb cost $270. 
Um, that one's a refurb and that's probably my best performer. Uh, versus, you know, trying to tinker and upgrade these machines, you just buy another one uh, and then use like a, a broke down machine for parts in the future, basically. And so that's why I'm kind of at this crossroads where it's like, I really want big machines, but which direction do I go? Do I go with like an Elegoo Armstorm Giga, which is like a thousand square build plate that can allow me to do really super huge stuff? Or do I go with something like a Prusa XL with five tool heads where I can do bigger stuff that's multicolored, which is kind of like the other kind of thing I do with my bamboos, but it's not quite as big as like say these, and especially not as big as the Giga. So it's kind of like, which way do I go? Because I don't know if I want to buy both. One's 3,000, one's like 5,000 just to get it here. So it's kind of like a lot of money upgrading and leveling up to that, that plane. But as I've spoken about in the past, you know, it's all about barriers to entry with 3D printing. Uh, and it has to do with what you're printing as well. But if you can have machines that are much more capable than what everybody else has, then that's going to give you an advantage. Yeah, as far as the roundup goes, I'm kind of running out of bamboo spools. I'm out of bamboo spools, so I'm printing these up. They're just, you know, sort of basic ones. I'm not exactly sure what happened here because this is 30% infill, actually. Uh, but the layers just didn't adhere to each other. I think maybe it was a setting because I'm just kind of recently switching into Anycubic's Cobra Slicer next. And so I just put these at 100 infill. Uh, completely solid, which is, you know, completely fine with me because it's a solid thing that's going to get used and function and it's not like really that much more filament. So doing that one, hopefully that one turns out better. And checking in over here on the A1, this uh, devil girl, she ran out of red in the night. And so it's not as far along as I would have hoped it had to been by now, but it's looking pretty good. A few other things too, I mentioned in a, a few videos ago that I was kind of exploring the, the concept of this like 3D text things, because uh, a lot of people do this. This is not like an innovative idea. It's basically 3D printing text. There's nothing special about it, but uh, kind of printing it in like, you know, a solid piece and then like this just, you know, a face plate that's offset two millimeters left and two millimeters up, and then just selling it for like, you know, your dog or your child's room or something like that, but again, you know, take this and then just individually print each letter 400 millimeters wide. And that way it would be, you know, super huge, you know, like kind of commercial grade or commercial sized, you know, so maybe if a uh, small business wanted a signage above like a, a merchandise section or something like that, you could do something like this. It appeals to a wide range of people because people like to label things and have quirky fun text over stuff. Also, thanks again to everyone in the comments for sharing your slicer settings. I was having trouble with supports. I've been having trouble with supports for like, uh, like well, forever, really, uh, on these art models. And so a lot of people, I posted my uh, settings yesterday. It's just, there's a lot of conflicting information. And a lot of the people in the comments saying one thing, you know, online or YouTube, 3D print gurus, uh, sort of saying another thing and a lot of this stuff conflicts and I'm going through the settings and trying different tests and I'm uh, adjusting settings that I'm like, well, wait a minute, this is supposed to be like the end all be all of uh, support settings. And so I'm just constantly kind of going back and forth and I'm kind of, I don't know, gaslighting myself a little bit here. It seems like I haven't had really good support settings other than the stock settings that come in the slicer. Um, so devil girl head here, this is probably the best example I've been able to do. Uh, but the time on this, it was supposed to take two days for this little piece right here. And so all I did was lift her up like this. And I think that, you know, obviously everyone knows that it has a lot to do with the orientation of the model because if you orient it like this, then it only has to do black. It only has to do white right here. And it only has to do black. And only up until here does it have to do red, white, black, and beige. Uh, and then, and it's those changes between colors that really take a lot of time swapping the colors because it's just going layer by layer by layer swapping and doing a little bit. And so drastically reduce the time. Uh, layer height's about, uh, is the same flushing volumes issue seem to be worked out. I put it at a 0.7, I think. Uh, but again, the supports, removing the supports on this, and I wish I would have videoed it, were just kind of peeling off and gummy. And oddly enough, I'm not sure why the slicer did this, but it would not allow me to uh, remove the specification of which filament to use for the support. And I think that's because I, I was gonna do it with PETG but in the end, I opted not to do that because it was just going to take so much longer for it. And I had concerns with the model being held up like this. If all of the supports, which the entire model would have been held up by supports, uh, one little contact point here and then the rest of the model supported fully by the supports. If all of these interface layers of the whole support is PETG, 
and PETG doesn't stick to PLA, uh, then you know, those micro vibrations might've caused the model to fall. And so in the end, I opted not to do that. If you think that that's uh, kind of not something I should worry about, let me know in the comments below, because I am curious about that. Uh, if the entire model is being held up on a interface layer of PETG, is there a chance that it's just gonna fall off? So I uh, still wanna do some experiments with that in the future to see if PETG is the right way to go. I also have that Polymaker breakaway filament that I could uh, use. But ultimately, doing this, and I'd have to look up the settings, but I believe this was at a 0.2 interface layer, and still, just it, it really difficult to remove. And eventually it did come off and it didn't damage the model. But you can kind of see here, it, it used blue PLA for some reason. But it kind of left this, uh, this, you know, this little pieces of it in there. And my, my gut instinct is saying that my uh, temperature setting for PLA might just be a little bit too high. And, that, and again, that's me with uh, showing my inexperience in the 3D print realm. But it seems to me if it's extruding, um, well, I mean, that wouldn't make sense. I mean, yeah, more, it would, because if this is PLA and it's extruding too hot, then that makes it more, less viscous and that it would flow into the nooks and crannies more or maybe possibly my interface layers. I'm not sure. If you've made it this far into the video and you see this and you can kind of, you, you kind of know where I'm going with it without seeing my settings, uh, let me know in the comments below what you think. Because again, I've gone through so many iterations and especially with this devil girl, of different support settings and none of them seem to really be hidden. And this is not a super fine detail. This is 0 0.18 uh, layer height, um, maybe point, even 0 0.2. Uh, so I, I would, I'd like to believe that it, it would snap away a lot easier, but I will take the win on the flushing volumes looking good and overall the uh, it looking crispy and clean. And that's another benefit of a model like this. It's not super highly detailed, like a photorealistic face. It's kind of cartoony. And I feel like you can kind of get away with a lot of that stuff. And then this on the back, a blowtorch will uh, kind of smooth that out. And so I think that's probably good to go. Another thing I was concerned about too is on these models, pricing them out, you know, because this and their whole body and whatnot, I was going to think like, okay, probably even the 75 range, 75, 80, maybe $90. Um, and I was kind of worried like, you know, people are coming in and saying people are never going to pay that. Uh, you know, people expect to have a perfectly smooth factory finish stamped out of a press, uh, flawless model, and they're only ever going to pay $50 for it. And I'm like, oh, damn, you know, it's not worth it at that price. Because again, I'm not coming from a place of love on this. I'm not an artist. Uh, but looking around on Etsy, some of the other NSFW-ish type models, uh, they're in that price range and they're, they're unpainted. Um, the ones that are painted well over a hundred dollars. And so I'm confident at that point, if I have a fully colorized model here, uh, those sort of slight imperfections would be offset completely by the fact that it is full color. It's completely assembled and it's ready to go. Uh, it ships from the United States and you know, it's free shipping too. So there's a lot of appeal there. Uh, so I'm not as concerned about that anymore. That was certainly a, a welcome thing to see. So once again, I appreciate all the new subscribers coming in. I appreciate you watching me on this journey. This is just, you know, sort of me doing day by day my thing in the 3D print space, learning as I go and uh, hopefully getting to the point where I can scale it up into something. I appreciate all the feedback and suggestions in the comments, all the views and all the engagement. Be sure to like the video and subscribe for more content like this. I'm The Technicals, see you next time.